Hey guys, welcome back to The Real Mr. Beer, Mr. Beer's own channel. We're here to provide homebrewing guidance and tips, equipping you with all sorts of beer knowledge. My name is Josh Ratliff, I'm a BJCP certified beer judge, brewmaster for Mr. Beer, and I'm the store manager at Everything Homebrew here in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, today we're going to be brewing our Aztec Mexican Cerveza refill. It's one of our top five best-selling refills and rates a 4.6 star review on our website. Um, this is considered an international pale lager, uh, and this one's about 5% alcohol when you use the two boosters. Without the boosters, it's about 3.7%. Um, it's got an SRM of 2, which stands for Standard Reference Method, and it's a system that modern brewers use to specify the color. Um, 2 is very, very light, so it's going to be very pale, uh, almost blonde. Um, this is going to be very similar to Corona, uh, Dos Equis Special Lager, or Tecate. Um, the refill for this is going to include your can and your yeast, which is underneath the lid. And it's also going to include two Brewmax boosters and one no rinse cleanser. Okay, and uh, about international pale lagers, these are supposed to be kind of, um, they're highly carbonated, well-balanced, refreshing, and thirst quenching. So unlike the Pilsner, which we did uh, um, the last two, uh, the first show, um, those are going to be a little spicier in the hops, and this is going to be a lot more balanced, uh, where there's a, a, a nice marriage between the hops and the, the malt itself. All right, and the, the booster that we're going to be adding, well, before we get to the booster, let me get some, let's get the can in, in some water. So these lids can be kind of difficult to open, and hopefully if I don't bend this again. Just making a couple, you can do it with scissors too, or, or a knife, just be careful. And then it pops right off, and you got your yeast underneath the lid there. All right, we'll set that aside for now and get this in some water. So we're going to soak this in some water to soften it up so it comes out of the can a lot easier. Now if you've done a deluxe recipe which uses our uh, liquid malt extract instead of the uh, booster, you might want to throw that in the hot water too, it'll soften it up as well. And while we're waiting for that to soften up, uh, let's get the booster going. Or should we sanitize first? Let's sanitize first. All right, so you want to clean your, your LBK really well, even if it's the first time using it. And once it's clean, then we're going to sanitize it. But first, we need to put the spigot on. Now your spigot's going to come with a nut, a washer, and the spigot body itself. And the way that it goes on is the flat side of the washer goes towards the spigot. You might have to kind of screw it on there. There we go, get that snug against the end there. So it looks like that. You want the tapered end going in towards the keg. Now you don't want to use any tools when doing this. Just finger tighten it, hand tighten it. Because if you use any kind of wrenches, it could break your spigot. Okay, we want to test that for leaks. <clears throat> Typically you're going to want to do about 30 minutes um, or even longer testing this, but I'm just going to do a quick test to make sure it's not leaking too much. All 
Alright, that looks good. Okay, I guess I didn't have to dump that out. So we're going to fill this up to the number one line. If you have one of our older tanks, it's going to be the four and a half quart line. So that's going to be one gallon of water right there. And you're going to take half of your no rinse cleanser and add it to the water. And that's about half there. You're going to save the other half of your bottles. Okay, we're going to put the, well before I put the lid on, I want to show you the notches on the, the keg here. There are two notches at the top of the keg that allow um, CO2 to escape during fermentation. Uh, without those notches, your keg would explode. So those are to uh, allow CO2 to escape um, and so ox and oxygen can't get in there obviously when you have CO2 off gas. So, um, the reason I pointed that out is because when you're going to shake this, you want to do it over the sink because it will not be watertight. And you will get a little bit of leaking. About 20, 30 seconds is good. And we're gonna go ahead and sanitize the spigot by pouring some of that water out of it into a bowl. And then we're gonna go ahead and dump what's left or what we can fit into this bowl here. And this is gonna be for sanitizing all of our tools. Okay, so the tools that we're going to be sanitizing are going to include your, your, your uh, can opener, um, scissors for opening your yeast, and a spoon. And then I have a pre-sanitized funnel that I'm going to use as well. A few questions. Scroll up here. Can you over tighten your spigot? Um, yeah, you can actually. That's why you don't want to use any tools. If you're hand tightening it, you're not really going to over tighten it unless you're unless you're on steroids or something. Um, it's going to be light like Corona or pack a punch like Mexican regional beers. It's going to be lighter like Corona, um, but instead of using the booster for the standard refill, you can go for the deluxe refill. And if you use the malt extract in there, it's going to be a little bit. Uh, a little bit more like the regional beers down there. And by the way, um, Mexican beers are based on a Vienna lager. Um, many, many years ago when uh, uh, Europe was still, you know, they took over uh, Mexico City and they had uh, a European as kind of a king uh, during their transitional period. And he had brought a Bavarian cook there that was also a brewmaster and he brewed beer there and it kind of became the regional favorite and spread from there. So most Mexican beer is based on Viennese lagers, which is a, an interesting point. Okay, let's see what other questions we got here. Does anyone add lime zest to this after primary fermentation? You know, I was actually thinking about doing this um, to this batch uh, come a week before bottling time. I'm going to add a little bit of lime zest into some Everclear or some pure grain alcoholic vodka 
um, just enough to cover it and let it soak and then add that in your secondary or a week before bottling and that'll give you a really nice lime flavor so I might do that in a future episode when we're uh, working on another beer alright so let's move on to getting this beer started uh, we got the Brewmax booster and we're gonna go ahead and put four cups of water in our pot Okay, and we're gonna start, you, you, you wanna start uh, using, putting the booster in while the water is cold. Otherwise, it just kinda gunks up on the bottom and gets, gets stuck to the bottom of the pot. And as you notice, I'm using a whisk and I'm not sanitizing it. That's because this is going to be boiled, so there's really no need to, no need to sanitize anything um, pre-boil. A little bit at a time works the best. And I usually like to start the heat once I get about halfway through, which will be one of these pouches. Gone. And just be patient with this stuff, it will dissolve. Just got to give it some time. I'll go ahead and get that next one thrown in there. Yeah, that's right, Miniota. Thank you for men mentioning that. Um, you do not have to rinse after sanitizing. Uh, that's why it's called no rinse. It is a food grade product. It basically turns into a type of um, type of a weak hydrogen peroxide. So in parts per million, it's not going to hurt you in any way. In in the small parts per million that it that it is. <laughs> What if you do if your booster's hard like a rock? That's a good question. Um, you can try to break it up and put it in there. It's gonna be it's gonna be a little more difficult for it to dissolve, uh, but it will dissolve over time. Just just be really patient with it. Otherwise, I mean, it's really cheap. It's only a buck seventy-five on our website, so just order a few extras when you're making a, a future orders. Okay, that's good enough. The rest of this will dissolve during the uh, while it's waiting to boil. Okay, so just to talk a little bit about our uh, <clears throat> brewing extracts, um, many of you may or may not know uh, we're owned by Cooper's Brewing Company um, in Adelaide, Australia. They make all of our extracts. Uh, they're the largest family-owned brewery in Australia and is the world's leadest pro uh, leading provider of high-quality brew uh, brewing malts. Um, our refills, uh, the extracts, they're known as HME, hopped malt extract. So the hops are already in here with the malt, so you don't have to add hops, but you can if you want to have some more flavor um, or aroma. Um, we take a lot of the main work out of it by by uh, concentrating the wort like this. Otherwise, you'd be doing you know five to eight hour brew day. Um, with that said, it doesn't take away a lot of creative control. Like I said, you can add extra things like we were talking about the lime peel. Um, um, you can add uh, you know some some grains. Like I would probably add like flaked corn and some two row to this to kind of beef up the the body a little bit while keeping the style. Uh, so there's a lot you can do. If you go through our recipes on our website and see how a lot of them are made with different components, you can get kind of ideas on, on making your own batch, and it's really not that difficult. There's really no, no wrong way to do it, and if you have any questions, don't hesitate to, uh, to call or go on our community forums and, and ask those guys, and there's a bunch of them on here now. So they're definitely, they're really, really helpful, helpful folks. 
Okay, we're almost to boil there. <clears throat> Let's get the rest of that booster dissolved. How does the booster get hard? Moisture, yeah, it's usually through um, um, keeping it in a in a like a uh, a high humidity environment. You want to try to keep it in a in a cool, dry environment. Um, that goes with all of your your products. Cerveza is Mexican for tequila, right? <laughs> Oh, and speaking of tequila and cerveza, another thing you can do um, that I've heard people doing with great results is adding a shot of tequila to your bottles. Give you kind of a little bit of a, you know, a little kick. A little water kick. A little tequila, <laughs> a little lime. <laughs> okay. Um, still waiting on the boil, so I'm going to talk a little bit about water. Um, we use um, we use a, a filtered, uh, purified water. We have filters on our, our tap systems. Um, you can use purified water or spring water. Um, reverse osmosis is fine. Uh, just try not to use your. It, well, it depends on where you live, but your tap water could have too much chlorine or chlorinase that can that can add off flavors to the beer. Um, so, so you really want to try to uh, to stick with something in a bottle or something purified or filtered. Um, distilled water isn't isn't uh, recommended um, because it lacks minerals that the yeast that the yeast use. So. You don't really want to do uh, distilled water unless you're getting really fancy and creating your own water profiles, which is for an advanced show. Okay, we got a boil here. Now let's go ahead and pull our malt extract out of the hot water. Now, you may have heard that little hiss. I don't know if it'll pick up on this camera. Some people kind of get wary and have asked about the little hiss when you crack these open. These are packed with nitrogen to keep them fresh, so don't worry about that. But if you do have a past date can and it's bulging like a lot, I don't recommend using it. All right, so we're going to remove this from heat. In our case, we're going to turn it off. You don't want to keep this on a, on a hot range um, where it's going to keep the bottom of that pot hot because it could scorch your malt and caramelize it and darken it. And that, that would uh, render some of the sugars unfermentable, which would also cause it to be overly sweet. If it helps, you can take the label off ahead, ahead of time uh, so you don't get any paper into the, the batch. I've done this enough, I, I don't really have to worry about that too much. You just gotta be sure you're not shredding, shredding the hell out of it with your can opener. Okay, that malt comes out so much easier when you soften it up in the hot water. Does it have a snake in it now? <laughs> when will be sharing gaming tips, Rick? You might want to feel that in the chat. Okay, so you want to let this dissolve until there's really nothing left coming off the spoon. Um, scrape the bottom, be sure there's none hanging out on the bottom. Now, we're going to fill this up with one gallon of cold refrigerated water. You want it to be cold and refrigerated because when you pour the hot wort in there, 
Then you top it off with more cold refrigerated water. It'll get you to about 65, 70 degrees, which is uh, where the yeast like to start fermenting at. You don't want to have it too warm. Um, you don't want to ferment too warm because you'll create um, off flavors like green apple, which is caused by acetaldehyde. Um, and think about the yeast kind of sweating when it's too warm. That sweat is the acetaldehyde and that, that green flavor. Um, so you want to be sure that you, you pitch cool and you ferment cool. So we're going to add one gallon of cold refrigerated water. And when you do um, keep water in gallon jugs like this, uh, it, it really helps to sanitize the jug ahead of time too, so that everything's sanitized. And with our pre-sanitized funnel, you don't have to use a funnel if you're, you think you're good enough to pour it in there, but uh, I prefer using it. We did make the, the mouths of these larger uh, with our newest model of keg so that it is a little bit easier for people to uh, pour the malt and also put fruit, remove fruit, and hot sacks, things like that. Okay, now we're gonna top the rest of that off with more cold refrigerated water. To the number two mark, or on the old kegs, it'll be the eight, eight, uh, eight liter, eight quart mark. This is also a really great beer to add other fruits like berries because of how light it is. We've even been uh, experimenting with, with hibiscus, which makes it a really nice pink color. And I think this would be a good, good one for uh, hibiscus or something like that too. Okay, so once that's to the number two mark, we want to stir this really, really, really well. This not only mixes um, the wort all together, but it also aerates the wort so that the yeast um, have plenty of accessible oxygen to uh, start fermenting. There's a different difference between aerating and oxidizing. Oxidizing usually happens over a longer period of time, but aerating, um, you don't ever want to sh uh, stir or shake or anything after fermentation has begun. But before fermentation, aerating the wort is going to be beneficial to the yeast. With a whisk or is it good with a spoon? Um, I did it with a, a rubber coated spoon. You can do it with a whisk. You just want to be careful not to mix it up too much. Uh, or I mean not to hit the sides too much if you're using metal you want to try not to scratch the inside of your keg um, scratches can harbor bacteria and it's very difficult to clean them all right the sanitized scissors I'm gonna open the yeast and toss it in you don't have to stir um, you can if you'd like some manufacturers do say to stir um, <clears throat> but the yeast are gonna find their their way to the sugars they're gonna hydrate themselves um, some people will do um, small starters if their yeast packet might be a little old, just put in a little bit of malt extract and stir it up and see if it's working. That's totally fine. Um, there's really no need to add another tool in there and stir it. You'd have to just sanitize it again or use the, the spoon that you just used. You don't really have to. Um, again, you want the yeast at the very beginning to have that access to oxygen. Keeping them at the surface gives them the access that they need. Close that up, and that will ferment for three weeks, um, two weeks minimum, but we recommend three weeks. Um, the first week, seven to ten days, is going to be primary fermentation. This is going to be the uh, time when the yeast um, consume all of the sugars. After about ten days, there's not going to be any more sugar um, left, and so they're going to start to eat some byproducts that they created during primary fermentation. Um, once those byproducts are done, then they're going to start falling out of suspension and creating a clearer beer. 
there will still be living yeast transferred over to your bottles, um, so I wouldn't worry about not having enough fresh yeast for carbonation. Um, and you can also uh, you can also cold crash your keg if you like. The last couple of days, this is something. Um, if you go on our forums, uh, Rick Beer has a whole article on there about it. Um, basically, you just take your keg, put it in the refrigerator for uh, 20, 12 to twenty four hours before bottling, and then um, and you can prop up the front too. He says you could prop it up with a book or something, and that kind of pushes the yeast back. And what uh, cold crashing does is it, it promotes the precipitation of all of that, uh, that uh, suspended particles into the sediment. So it pushes all that sediment down and gives you a nice compact yeast cake so that you can uh, have a little bit more yield of beer. So you're not losing so much when you're, when you're bottling. All right, is this all grain or extract? This is an all grain batch. Um, we're going to be moving on to, um, or I mean extract batch, I'm sorry. We're going to be moving on to all grain batches um, in, in future shows. Uh, we're going to have uh, uh, basically, this is going to be a beginner show on Tuesdays, and then I think we decided Wednesdays is going to be more intermediate, and Fridays mm -hmm. is going to be more advanced. Um, so we will have some all grain batches in the future. Of course, we can't fit five to eight hours of all grain brewing into you know one hour show. But for the advanced shows, we may go go a bit over, or we may start the show um, time it to where it's a crucial point in the all grain. We may talk about the mash the first show, and then do another batch, and we'll talk about the 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 sparging and then the boil in another show. So we'll kind of separate them out over different recipes, but you'll get the whole idea. Is it best to mix with a whisk? Um, it really doesn't matter. It, I think it really helps. Uh, the whisk is really, really great for the, um, the booster and when you're using dry malt extract because it clumps up so much. So a whisk is really, really nice to, to break all those clumps up really, really fast. Okay. HME in your coffee. Um, you know, a regular unhopped malt extract is actually really good in coffee, but I haven't thought about putting hops in my coffee. <laughs> That'd be kind of weird, honestly. You made yourself a wort chiller out of copper tubing. Works great. That's cool. We'll, we'll get into things like that, too, in, in more advanced shows, wort chillers and uh, the tools of the trade. Let's see if I missed any more questions. Does anyone else have any more questions they want to put up before we uh, close out for the day? Let's see if I'm missing anything here. All right. Um, the blog. I should definitely mention the blog. Um, you can find a lot of this information at uh, www.mrbeer.com slash blog. I'm sure Rick will link that uh, shortly. Um, that has all kinds of different tips. We have articles on using hydrometers, um, um, choosing bottles, uh, using grains in your in your Mr. Beer kit, which we'll we'll get into uh, in a future episode as well. What do you recommend to monitor the temperature while the war of the war while it is brewing? Um, you can just use any. We have adhesive stick-on thermometers that work really great. The key is to put it underneath the the liquid level um, on your keg. Um, we, you can, I've seen some really uh, innovative guys on the forums um, creating uh, temperature controllers with the, or temperature ports on their lids and putting probe, temperature probes through them. So um, there's all kinds of cool things like that. Um, when you're in the summertime brewing, if it's getting too warm, uh, one trick that we like to do here in Arizona, especially because we really feel the heat in the summer. Um, is we take our, our little brown keg and we put it in a camping cooler and surround it with uh, ice packs or frozen ice water bottles and just replace them out every 8 to 12 hours. Um, and that'll definitely keep, keep your uh, temperature of your, your beer down. Uh, you do want to keep in mind that when we talk about temperatures on our websites and on our recipes, this is ambient temperature. So keep in mind that the, the fermentation creates about 5 extra degrees inside. So if you're if you have a probe in your beer it's going to show warmer than ambient temperature so try not to confuse the two too much do i do the blog i do contribute some posts i have a few articles on there um some more of the uh you know the hydrometers and more of the home brewing tips and such 
Um, another more advanced way of monitoring temps, some people have gone out and bought, you know, old college refrigerators, those little dorm fridges for 30, 40 bucks. And you can convert that into a, a, a fermentation chamber by attaching a temperature controller, which we do sell on our website. We sell the Inkbird temperature controllers, which are great. We have several of them uh, hooked up around um, our brew room. And, uh, um, and so you plug in your, your temperature controller, your fridge to the temperature controller, and then you plug that into the fridge and it, it will kick off whenever uh, you're at a certain temperature and then kick back on whenever uh, you, you go over the other threshold. You can set a high and a low, however much range you want. Yes, you need to focus more on the ambient temperature because um, that's what most, uh, pretty much any recipe you see online or any yeast manufacturer, they're always talking about the ambient temperature and not the temperature of the beer itself or the wort. And uh, any extract kits to replicate an any IPA? Um, we actually just released one. Um, it's called the American Resolution uh, Hazy IPA. It's a New England style. It uses the Barbarian liquid yeast. It's actually our first beer with liquid yeast in a really long time. Um, they are limited supply though because of the liquid yeast and because it has a short shelf life. So recommend buying it as soon as possible and using it as soon as possible. Um, All right, and I think I've got everybody's questions. Um, we'll have uh, these, these uh, uh, Tuesday shows will be a little shorter. They're gonna be focused on beginners. So um, the future shows will be longer and we'll, we'll be able to uh, get into some more advanced stuff. And uh, again, for you guys from the forums and for you guys that aren't on the forums, I recommend going and checking the forums out. Uh, we do have a thread on there where, we, uh, where I'm asking for ideas for topics and shows for the future, things that you wanna, you wanna hear, hear us cover. Um, so, Thanks again for uh, joining us, and tune in uh, tomorrow. We're going to be brewing a St. Patrick's Irish Stout, um, hopefully in time for St. Patrick's Day, or at least around there. So take care, guys.